All right, campus pastors, you preaching dudes, Derek and all y'all. Let me talk to you just a little bit. Five reasons why um, a church in multiple locations is an important part of our missional direction. I mean, it's an important part of what we do. Um, first of all, um, it is the first biblical reason is it's submissional. Um, we submit to what Jesus told us to do. Therefore, multi-site fits the bill for what Jesus asks of us. Let me give you, in Matthew 28, 18, we have the Great Commission. And in the Great Commission, here's what Jesus said. Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And what Jesus is saying here, he said, there's a few things you got to do. You got to go, you got to make disciples, you got to baptize, and you got to teach them to obey everything. Now, that, that was his mandate. Now, it's interesting that Jesus didn't say, just go and preach the gospel. It's not what he said. That, that would only be partial obedience. He didn't, he, in fact, he doesn't even say it that way. He says, make disciples. And that begins by teaching the gospel, sharing the gospel. And then you teach people to live the gospel and share the gospel. But he says, make disciples. But he doesn't just say make disciples. He says, baptize. And that says, hey, help them understand their identity is found in Christ. Then he says, teach them to obey. Now, how do you teach people to obey everything Jesus has said? That's a life application. I mean, as you're going through life, people are going to do something silly and you go, oh, don't do that. God wants us to live this way. And so that teaching them to obey is, is going through life with people, helping them find or helping them find God's pathway and the understanding of God's commandments. Because as they go through life, inevitably on the job training has it that you're going to make some mistakes. That's why it's on the job training. You're going to be doing what you do, living the way God asks you to live so that you, as you make mistakes, that elder person, that discipler, if you will, is going to say, hey, you, let's don't do that because that's not the way God has called us to live. Um, but if you look at all those together, that's what he's asked us to do. Uh, go make disciples, um, baptize, and, and, and on top of that, he, he's told us to teach them to obey. So those are the things that Jesus said. This, as a matter of fact, these are the final things that Jesus left us with to do. Interesting thing, when I was a kid, my mom used to leave us with a chores list. I hated chores. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I hated chores like I can't tell you. My mom would always put a list up and inevitably I would get punished and grounded and all those other things. Well, one day mom was, was thinking this thing through and she's like, you know, there's got to be a better way because this kid, you know, is just a moron. He doesn't want to do what I ask him to do. And, and so what mom said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave a list, but then if you do everything on that list while I'm at work during the day, and when I come home, I'll inspect. And if you've done what I've asked you to do, I'm going to give you an allowance. Now, allowances aren't you don't ever hear people talking about allowance anymore. Um, but basically, she'd give me a small sum of money each day, and it was a very small sum of money, but it was more than I had before, um, to do everything on the list that was, you know, while she was at work. Now, when she would go away to work, I would certainly get in there and I would do a few things. There was a few things that I enjoyed doing on that chore list. I'll give you an example. I, it sounds crazy, but I like cleaning the bathrooms. I just did. There was something about the smell of pine saw and walking out of a clean bathroom made me feel fulfilled. I don't know. It's weird. But it is what it is, okay? And so I would clean the bathrooms like crazy, loved that. But then there was other chores that was on the list that I hated. One of the things that I hated was washing dishes. I mean, I loathe washing dishes. There's nothing worse than having to set over the dishes and wash. my back would hurt. I'd get my shirt wet and hated it. So what I would do is I would put all this energy into cleaning the bathroom because that's what I liked doing and that's what I, I was better at. But then I wouldn't wash the dishes. And then there were other chores I didn't do so well. And then there's other chores I did really well. When mom would come in, though, she'd pull the list off the refrigerator and she'd go through and she'd go, oh, good job. That's amazing job. The bathroom looks wonderful. And then she'd go to the dishes and she'd go, the dishes aren't done. I said, yeah, I know, but did you see the bathroom, mom? <laughs> Look, bathroom, don't, yeah, yeah, leave those alone. Look at that. And she's like, yeah, but I asked you to do the dishes. And the floors aren't done. I asked you to do the floors. Well, I hated doing the floors. Well, I'd say, well, but, but, but mom, look, I did all these other things. She said, no, this was the deal. You do the list that I give you in its entirety, and then I give you an allowance. That's how it works, son. You don't get to pick and choose what you're good at or what you want to do. You do the whole list. And my mom wouldn't pay me until I did the whole list. That's just the way it worked. You know, Jesus is exactly the same way. What we tend to do in churches is we tend to focus on certain things that we feel more comfortable with or that we're better at. And there are some churches that are really good discipling churches. They have all these little disciple groups and they have mentoring groups and they have all these things that they do and they're really good at working with Christians. 
Um, they're not so good at working with the unchurched. You don't see them win a lot of people to Christ. And, and we sometimes think, well, if I'm really good at this one niche market, then Jesus is going to blur his eyes and say, don't worry about the rest of that. Um, but Jesus didn't do that. He gave us some particular things he said you have to do. One of the things that you have to do is you have to go, you have to make disciples, um, you have to baptize them, and you have to teach them. That's what Jesus said. That's exactly what has to happen. Now, we can't pick out one part of that and leave the other part off. Multi-site, the reason why multi sites important as opposed to, say, an evangelism conference or, say, a crusade. We could go into a city and just do kind of a Billy Graham thing and just preach the gospel and, and just leave people hanging where they are. But that's not the pattern of the New Testament. The New Testament has it that you plant churches. Multi-site fits all of those things. When we put a church in a community, we are able to go, number one, we're able to make disciples, we're able to baptize, and we're able to teach them to obey. We fulfill the mandate that Jesus gave. So this is submission all. It's submission to God's commandment to carry out the gospel. And, and as far as the Great Commission is concerned, we do that through multi-site. It fulfills all of those things. Um, the second thing is, is that it is missional, in fact. It is missional. Um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. I'm not going to read that entire verse, but the first part of, of, of really from 19 through 22, Paul's just saying, I'm strategic in that. Whoever I'm with, I try to find common ground with that person so that I may be able to have a chance to, to win them to Christ. He's talking on a, on a global level, though. Paul's talking about in a community, you have to find common ground with that community so that you can win them to Christ. Now, let me start reading with verse 22, and it'll make complete sense. To the weak, I become weak. That's Paul speaking. He says, to win the weak. So I have to find a common ground with them. We do this in conversations. I mean, I do this all the time. I, I talked to a guy not too long ago, and he was like, you know, I'm a hand glider. He likes to hand glide. Well, I'm... I'm not a hand glider, you know, I'm scared of heights and plus I'm big. You don't see very many big people getting on a huge kite and jumping off a cliff. It just, it, it's just limited. You know, mine no, doesn't, wouldn't glide, it would drop. It would, you know, it's just, there's, there's got to be a load limit. You know, can you imagine a hand glider with all the wings all bent up like that and I'm craning to the ground, you know, to, to die. So, but, but I thought, you know, how can I find common ground with this guy? Because I want to have conversation with him. I want, I want to have some good dialogue with this guy. So I immediately told him, I said, well, you know, I was on a mountain once. I mean, hand gliders, you got to jump off a mountain. So I was on a mountain and, hey, you know, wherever you need to go with that thing. So anyway, Paul says, I'm going to find this, this common ground so that I can have the conversation with them. And then he goes on further. He says, I have to become all things to all people. Become all things. That means I've got to be strategic in whatever circumstance that I'm in. He goes on to say, so that by all possible means, ring that bell, pastor. So by all possible means, what does all possible means? It means anything necessary. Multi-site right now is under a big critique by most of the traditional churches because, well, to be quite honest with you, what they do kind of stinks. And so therefore, they, they don't want you to be successful either. So they're going to critique anything else that is actually working because it makes them look bad. You know, we want you to be miserable and a handful of people just like us. So how dare you go out and actually do something that's successful? So one of the things that they're doing is, is they're beginning to critique or kind of knock down the idea of multi-site. They're saying it's unbiblical, it's this. No, it's not. Paul said you use whatever means possible. So what does that mean? It means whatever means possible. Let me tell you something. Multi-site is strategic and it's missional. If we're going to reach into a community and find common ground with the community, then you've got to put a church in that community. And when you put a church in that community without resources, it doesn't work. So when we do a multi-site church, we put a church in that community, we provide resources, systems, processes, leadership, um, accountability, it's all put in there. And guess what? Now we've got a place that can fulfill that great commission that we just talked about. Multi-site does those things. It's missional. The third thing is it's historical. It's interesting to me. Most of people's experiences when it concerns itself with the church is based on what they experienced, it's, but it's not based on what the Bible actually teaches us. Now you may or you may not know this, but the vast majority of the New Testament, when we get past the Gospels and actually into this, this church planting piece that's around Acts chapter 12 and further, what you're going to find is, is that the majority of the New Testament, the vast majority of the New Testament, is made up of letters that were written to churches by pastors who weren't at those churches. People tell you today, well, we have to have a flesh and blood pastor at our church. How dare somebody use video? Because video doesn't work. You can't use video because it's unlawful. Well, wait a second. 
The truth is, is that was Paul at the church at Thessalonica when he wrote the letter to the church of Thessalonica? No, he was not. Was he at Philippi when he wrote the, the letter? Matter of fact, the word epistle, that's not the, the, the children of the apostles. The word epistle actually means letter. Th these are letters to the churches. So, so it, it, when you read um, to Philippians, that's the church at Philippi. When you read the letter of, of Galatians, that's to the churches, plural, by the way. Let me show it to you. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me. Now listen, to the churches, plural, to the churches in Galatia. Did you get that? It's to the churches. It's not one church in Galatia. It's a network of churches. It is multi-site in Galatia. Paul would have used video if he had it, but he didn't have video. So what did he do? He sent a letter. Let me tell you how this worked. Paul would send this, this letter. Let me, let me find it. I got it up in here. This, church to the, this, this letter to the Galatians, these churches, this network of churches in Galatia, he sent this letter, and here's what happened. They got the letter. And guess what they did? On Sunday, first day of the week, the Lord's Day, someone who was appointed would stand before everybody and say, listen, here's what, here's what our pastor says. Paul, an apostle, sent not with a human commission or not by human authority, but by Jesus Christ, and he would go through and he'd read this letter. And I think sometimes he may even make fun of Paul. He said, you know, Paul right here, you know, he'd say right here, he'd say this, and, and it's funny. Um, but, but, but the truth is, this would be a letter they would read to the churches. That's what an epistle is. It's a letter to the churches. Paul was not at the church at Galatia. You know where Paul was? He was somewhere else. Many times he was in prison, or he's at another church, planting another church. And he would send this letter to the church at Galatia. The first church would get it. They may even copy this letter down. They would keep it, study it, dissect it. They would grab a hold of every piece they could. Then they would take this letter and they would send it to the next church that was in Galatia. Hey, here's the letter. We, we've, we've used it. Here, it's your turn. And they would get it and they would take that letter and they'd go, oh my gosh, here it is. And they would read it to their congregation. Do you see what I'm saying? So the majority of the New Testament is letters to churches that the pastor isn't at. So now we've got a problem if you think that the pastor has to physically be at a church. By the way, just so you know it, it's a most very recent phenomenon that churches had their own exclusive pastor. If you go back 75 to 100 years ago in American history, you're going to find there was something called circuit preachers. What were circuit preachers? They were men who would mount on a horse and they would ride to a church and they would preach and they would teach and they would disciple. They would get back on their horse and they'd ride a little further and they'd go to the next church. Now that church that they first preached at, they may not be back there for a month, two months, or even three months. That church didn't have its own pastor. It had elders, had deacons, had teachers. And that pastor would make his loop all the way around. He would speak. He was the authoritative person. He was the pastor, but he wouldn't be there that often. That's how the church operated. Only today do we believe that every church has to have an exclusive pastor. Now, let me say this. I think it's worth noting. There's a lot of people who think they have the gift of preaching that don't. That's one of the reasons why we have so many little bitty microscopic churches that are struggling. Not everybody who thinks they have the gift of preaching has the gift of preaching. That's why Paul tells us when you're evaluating your gifts, you need to soberly evaluate your gifts. Because many times we overestimate what we're really able to do. And so, so what we have is we, we don't have a lot of teaching pastors. We have a lot of people that could, that could pastor, they could administrate, they can minister. But when it comes to the communication, not everybody can do that. So it's a historical fact that the Bible is made up of letters written to churches that the pastors weren't at. Now, let me just tell you, Paul wasn't the only person that did that. If you look at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, you're going to find that 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were epistles. They're letters to churches. Matter of fact, in 3rd John 9, it says this, John writes, he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. Why is he writing to the church? Because he's not there. What would they do with that letter? They would read it. Sunday morning, hey guys, we got a letter from John, get ready. This is big. And they would read it. Do you see? The exact same thing's true. You say, well, well gosh, you know, that's just that's John and Paul. What about Jesus? There's a book at the very end of all these books. It's the 66th book in this book we call the Bible. It's crazy. Um, in the 66th book, it's called the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 1, here's what it says. Verse 4. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. You know what the book of Revelation is? It's a revelation that was given to an angel by Jesus. And from that angel, it was given to John. And by John, it was sent out to these churches as a message. Jesus writes a letter to these churches. He writes a letter to churches that he's not physically preaching in front of, but that he wants a message to get to them. So even Jesus uses the same methodology that Paul uses, that John uses, that the early church used, that we're using. So it's historical. 
The vast majority of the New Testament is letters from pastors to churches that they were not at. Now, here's the critique. Here's what people will say. And I've heard this already. When you do multi-site, what that really is happening is idolatry. People are beginning to worship that pastor way too much. He's getting too popular. Here's what I have found. I found that those of you who are at the multi-site campuses that use a video portion for teaching, you are less connected to me and you're less dependent upon me than the people who are here with me flesh and blood. The person that's got to stand in front of me and shake my hand and hug my neck and touch my face and ah, I'm so glad to be close, that's usually the consumers. But the people who are missionaries don't have to have me right there. You get your information and you go and live for Jesus. I think that churches that are using um, multi-site technology through video and et cetera are actually more missional than the churches who have a flesh and blood person in front of them. It's just my opinion. So it's historical. Let me give you the third thing. It's technical. Paul used the latest technology in his day. You know what it was? It was the written word. It was letter sending. By the way, before the Roman Empire, letter sending was almost impossible. But the Roman Empire, one of the things they knew was to hold an empire together as big as theirs, communication was important. And so communication is written word, put it in the mail and send it off. Paul sent letters like crazy. That's why you have the New Testament. In fact, if you take out all the letters that were written out of the New Testament, you'd only have about four books. That's it. That's all that would be left of the New Testament. It's, it's all letters. That was the latest technology of the day. Now, let me give you this. Seats, pipe organs, printed words, microphones, they were all innovations at one time. And every single one of them were resisted in the beginning. Now, can you imagine using a sound system? Someone said, that, that's, we, we can't do that. It's unholy. They did it one time in churches. But how would you like to, to try to hear the pastor when you're at the back of the room when he doesn't have a microphone or a sound system? Ridiculous, right? But at one time, people resisted it. Multi-site is the new way of reaching community, which is actually finds its roots in the history of the church itself. So we need to tell them that. So number five, it's sensible. It's sensible. Uh, Multi-site is sensible. It's the better way to use resources, to be honest with you. I mean, it's way better. It's the best way to use resources. Now, look what, what Paul writes in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. He writes this. He says, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told, listen, the Galatian churches to do. Do what I told them. How did he tell them to do it? He sent one letter, and that one letter was distributed to all those churches, and everybody got the same information. Everybody worked together in unity. Everybody collected in the same way. Do you see how, how your resources are, are multiplied? How that you take one item and instead of it just be used for one church, it's used for multiple ones. We recycle sets. We recycle technology and lighting. We recycle systems and processes. We share leadership. I made a list. We share leadership. We share resources. We share our reputation. We share systems, technology, talent, wisdom, and processes. That's just a, a short list of all the things that we share because we're in a multi-site situation. There are things that small churches could not do or have if it weren't for the fact that they're plugged into something bigger right here at that church. And, you know, the one thing that I ask people that have a problem with multi-site is I ask them this. What biblical mandate, what biblical mandate can you find that says don't go? Don't do it. Where's that at? It's not there. You know, most of this, the critique that you get is from people who are really jealous about what God's doing. Multi-site works. Let me give you a statistic that you ought to share with people. 90% of multi-site campuses make it. Only 10% fail. That's the numbers. That's a hard number. 90% may only 10% fail. Now, the opposite statistic is true. About 80% of church plants fail with only 20% making it. So multi-site has a success rate that's very high. Lots of people being saved. Matter of fact, let me give you some numbers that you can share um, with your peeps for our multi-site. This is including Conway and Madonna, and the, the little bit of work that we've done in Denver, okay? Here's the multi-site statistics. Um, over the past three years, we have hosted 468 services. That means we hosted 468 serv weekend services over the past three years, okay? Out of that, we have preached God's word to 36,660 people. Now, those are not, that doesn't mean that unique people. That means that, you know, they may be coming back every week, but we fed them God's word. Um, we, ha we served 36,660 meals. Um, 36,660 people received God's word, fed on his word that week through our multi-site work. Um, 3,925 students were fed a meal of God's word. Again, those are, are not unique. I'm not talking about 3,900 unique students, but in the same way that you would say, well, we, you know, we fed, you know, 10,000 people. Well, you may have only fed 5,000 people, but, but they ate the meal twice. It's the same kind of deal. 
Um, we have baptized 90 people through multi-site work, 90 people in three years. Um, we have seen 781 people come to know Christ as their personal Savior in the past three years. That, made, that means at all of our multi-site campuses combined, we've seen 781 people commit their life to Jesus Christ uh, and made a public profession of faith at our campuses. That's pretty amazing. Those are powerful numbers. That, that, those numbers are, are huge. Is multi-site working? It is. Does it have some gotchas? It does. Um, have we got it all figured out yet? Not yet. Not yet. Um, but we're working on it, and we're going to keep pressing towards that thing. It's definitely a part of our missional emphasis. And I think sharing with people, you know, what our vision is for that may help people to expand beyond themselves. Multi-site causes us to be external instead of internal. It causes us to consider eternal instead of internal. Um, and it fulfills the mandate that Jesus gave us. Feel free to add some stuff to that. If you want to put some scripture in with it, do it. Um, Multi-site is here to stay. It's a big part of what we do. It's a way that we can maximize resources um, for kingdom's good. So... It is what it is. If you need me, I love you guys. Just holler at me. Give me a call, and we'll kind of go from there. God bless you.